Country hand bell ringers abounded in days of yore throughout Britain, playing popular country tunes such as the keel roll. The next development from simple in hand ringing was two bells in each hand, which is referred to as four in hand. This enabled more complicated music to be played with a smaller band. Further developments in both the music and the number of bells used resulted in overtures being played by the 1880s. This photograph of Middleton handbell ringers taken in 1853 is the oldest known photograph of any band. It predates the first known photograph of a brass band by a year. The Royal Poland Street handbell ringers seen here were playing the bells in the pre-1866 upright manner as demonstrated next by St Bernardo's ringers. I'm in the Pennine town of Home Firth. Now the Pennines were the cradle of the development of handbell ringing. In the 1700s there were wakes here in Home Firth, but there were also wakes in other towns and people would travel in horse and carts over the Pennines to the other town such as Glossop. So let us now travel in time with them. We've come over the Pennines from home Firth, where they held their wakes and men would come over, women, children, in a horse and cart and it's 13 miles the distance, not too far in a horse and cart and they would reach here and there would be merriment etc and this pub behind me, the Bull's Head, was the headquarters of the Glossop Handbell Ringers. And the Glossop Handbell Ringers were in fact made up of eight brothers, a unique band in the world of handbell ringing. The Glossop wakes were in actual fact held right behind the Bull's Head Hotel. The wakes were in actual fact nothing to do with the modern wake of a funeral. They were in actual fact a holiday time, usually over two or three days, and they would all have a great time. And this gave rise to public house contests of all manner of uh, types, including handbell ringing. The amount of liquor that everybody was supplied was absolutely enormous. The Morris dancers got free quarts, the waiters, uh, the, the handbell ringers, the fiddlers and even the police constable. The date of uh, this particular account is the 1790s and is a very good and detailed report as to what actually took part at this rush bearing. The Industrial Revolution in Britain took place approximately between 1730 and 1830. This revolution went hand in hand with the Agricultural Revolution which started before it but was accelerated by the enclosure acts of the 18th and 19th centuries. Whilst as a result of these acts, small farmers received compensation for their land, it was very little, and the loss of the rights of the rural population led to an increased dependency on the poor law. Only a few found work in the increasingly mechanised enclosed farms, many relocated to the towns or cities to try to find work in the emerging factories of the Industrial Revolution. Those men who stayed on the farms usually had to serve a seven-year apprenticeship and sign an agreement they would not marry until their time was finished. Many, of course, decided to take a wife and move to the town. 
as the song, the Dalesman's Litany, demonstrates. It's hard when folks can't find their work Where they've been bred and born When I were young I always thought I'd bided much from corn But I've been forced to work in town So here's my litany From Hull and Hell and Halifax Good Lord deliver me when I was caught in Mary Jane, old squire he comes one day. He says I've gotten a room for wedded folk, so choose to go or stay. I could not give up the lass I loved, so to town I had to flee. From Hull and Hell and Halifax, good Lord deliver me. The introduction of the postage stamp in 1840 opened up avenues of communications. So now a national contest could be advertised and entries taken. In 1847, John Fielden, the MP for Todmorden, brought in the 10-hour working day act, giving more time for hand buildings to rehearse. This was shortly followed in 1853 by the first contest at Bellevue. How did, how did you find bands to interview? Well, I had the list of Bellevue prize winners and that was a, a great uh, help. And so I kept seeing various names on there and uh, one of them actually was uh, Woodroyd. Now I went to Woodroyd and I simply uh, went and into pubs and asked did anybody know uh, any of uh, anybody who knew anything about Woodroyd and Bellwingers and somebody said yes there's a, a chap uh, lives up road they gave me his address Stanley by and he said he knows he was one of the actual uh, ringers and so I went up and spoke to, to Stanley by and uh, he showed me the bells at Woodroyd Chapel in uh, Conley, um and he said, um, "Did he want me to? Uh, did I want him to put him in touch with any other ringers?" And I said, "Well, could we arrange a meeting? Uh, how many are there?" He said, "Well, there's quite a lot." And so I arranged a meeting one night in Woodroyd Chapel, and all these men were in there, and they were all enjoying themselves. And one thing that I noticed was that there was they were discussing uh, the war records. <laughs> and where they went in the war and that because some of them hadn't actually met since the Second World War and this uh, sort of interview that I did with them was in 1978 hey. Raymond when it was Despies at Belleville ah. and we were at Satan when they gave out Willie Woodhouse jumped off platform and went through the floor <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he no the wonder <laughs> man you're a big lad <laughs> 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 Peter, how did you go about your research and what inspired you to do it? Well, I've always been inter interested in every tradition, no matter what country it was. And I first got interested in the Irish tradition after I got interested in the English tradition. And it was an Irishman who suggested to me that I might find some um, traditions of my own and so I started looking and then in a book about Clifton and Hart's Head near where I lived there was a, a little note said that um, Clifton once had some handbell ringers and the bells were in store 
in the village and did anybody know any more? And so I used to work at Kirtley's Hall for Sir John and Lady Armitage. And so I inquired there as to anybody, did anybody know anything about me, my former workers? And one of the workers said, yeah, go see a man with a little dog. And so I arrived at the Armitage Arms and looked for a man with a little dog. And instantly, when I asked him the question, did he know where the Clifton handbell ringers uh, had left their belts? And he said, the Clifton handbells are in Lister's wire mill at the bottom of Clifton Common. So what sort of condition were the bells in? Ah, the bells, they, um, they were in a, a sorry state. Uh, the bell metal, of course, doesn't deteriorate, but all the um, uh, striker mechanisms were there. A lot of the handles had deteriorated. The area where they were kept in an old mill, that floods regularly, although now they have a, they've got flood defences, but they didn't. And so um, soil and um, stuff that flowed in to where the bells were and uh, there was grass growing out, out of um, the centre of the bells on some of them. But some of them were in a box on a stone table. And so they were saved along with, uh, along with the music and the um, Bellevue price list, which uh, we are showing here today. So do them bells still exist? Uh, the bells, yeah, they, they, they still exist. And uh, what happened was Clifton decided to buy a, a new set of bells and then those bells were passed on, uh, well, they were sold on to uh, another, another band and they're still in use now, like. But... Um, the, that's one point about it, about these traditional bands going right back in history. There was no sentiment attached to a set of bells, other than when they opened them and um, they gave them a, a, a name like the Ebenezer set and stuff like that. They gave the, the whole set of bells a name, but there were no, set, no sentiment at all. As soon as those were worn out, they were uh, sold on and a brand new set um, purchase because they had to have the best bells in order to win the British Open. You couldn't have bells that weren't tip-top condition. My research showed that bands in years gone by made sure they left a record of their activities, as this booklet from Shelley of 1874 demonstrates. And incidentally, uh, Jimmy Ellis and uh, Ben Cook, they were like the Lionel Messi and the Jimmy Greaves of handbell ringing. Um, ben Cook, he was the biggest figure of handbell ringing in the, in, in the 1800s and he could turn any band into winners. He uh, took over Liversidge and Liversidge, when they entered the year before, they were the worst band at Bellevue. Two years later, under Ben Cook, they, they won the British Open Championship and Jimmy Ellis was very similar. Uh, but he was a different era, of course. He was the greatest figure of the 1900s, uh, uh, like, you know, the, um, the 20th century. And During the 1901 tour of the USA, the six Almondbury handbell ringers were paid £75 a week. Quite a sum in those days. I interviewed Adel Godward in 1977. His first performance was on January 19, 1907, at the age of 15. So it was well qualified to answer my questions on the old days. Uh, but Carson Moore, one thing that Carson Moore did They, they were the, really the first ones that damped the bells in between. Up to then, they hadn't bothered damping the bells that played like, just like a pedal down on the piano all the way through. Mm -hmm. You see, instead of where if you're playing the piano properly, you'll change your pedal. Mm -hmm. You see, as different harmonies come, you'll change that. Otherwise, it's one long roar, you yeah. see. 
carry on and bringing on. They, and they all, they all love one body and, and, and there were all the other layers around. They rang and they didn't bother damping the bells. Mm. You see. And what, what year would you say when they started damping? What time would that be about? Crossler Moor United handbell wingers in this wonderful picture still hold the record for the most consecutive wins at any British Open contest held at Bellevue. They had like six wins in a row. Now that lasted right until 1978 I was in the audience at uh, Bellevue for the uh, British Open Brass Bank Contest and Black Diet Mills needed one win that year in 1978 uh, in order to equal Cross the Moor United's record. The announcement was made who was the winners? Brighaus and Rastic Everybody jumped a yard in the air, including me. But I wasn't cheering for Brighouse and Rastrick. I was cheering for Cross the Moor United handball wingers, whose record stands to this day. Bands lost members in the Great War. Crossland Moor Public lost several. Home Firth were a very young band and unlike others, Home Firth did not reform after the war ended. In 1977 I spoke to Walter Tolson, one of the Clifton pre-Great War handbell ringers, who told me Dr Arthur Eaglesfield Hull was the organist at Uddersfield Parish Church. At the nearby Old Hat Hotel, he would play through the test piece for the contest to be held for the Yorkshire Association delegates. He wrote a book but was accused of plagiarism in 1927. As a result, he unfortunately threw himself under a train at Huddersfield Railway Station. And so, what you reckon competition were were, were uh, keen? Ooh, oh, yeah, very keen, very keen. Um, you uh, know, how, how keen were it? Like, would the uh, well, go to any length? We played. We won. We uh, what were we won? All them Rosamond. Rosamond. Hundred marks out of hundred. Ah, and uh, we were. We were it we saddle worth that came to us and said we couldn't play like that. We oh, well, I know there were, uh, there were a bit of he discussion. Said, he said it was impossible, impossible to play to that speed. Yeah. Well, after you'd won, you'd always to play to spectators, a free do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so we said, well, when we play to you, the spectators, I'm coming down at Sala and see what we don't play to that. Uh -huh. He said, well, let's some know what's here. Well, we didn't. I know we played if we won. There were some runs in it. Uh -huh. and it, 
And that was years we got that we got four hundred points. Yeah, Doctor has said it were unbelievable what he did. Uh, he said he couldn't. I don't know what's the word. He couldn't question it at all. He said I'm bound to give the full remark. He said, I can't find any fault. Who, were, uh, who, was, who came second that time then? And what? And was this at uh, this uh, where you got hundred really marks? Was that at Bellevue? No, that no at, uh, Tony Vale. Uh, 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 Yorkshire no, Association no, College. No, 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 no. When we when we did play that again, it, what Judge asked us to do. Uh -huh. He wanted to see us do it. He wanted see, to see us behind the scenes when he judged it. Yeah. And, and, and he said he'd like yeah. to see it before I'm redared it. And, and we'd to play what it again. What happened there with uh, Treble End? There were four or five, four or five. It Treble oh, Norris, me and Lewis. Uh, no, 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 Lewis when he passed. Oh, bottom there, oh, so oh, He could have had his phone on his point. Because I'd arranged it for one. Me, Ronald and Will. Right, that's it. And we run without copies. We, mm -hmm. knew it, we knew it that well. Mm -hmm. We'd had it drilled into us. Mr. Well. Warbrook, he had a, a good gramophone in them days and he bought record oh. and he used to dab it on anyway, you know, on at 78 speeds. He yeah. used to put it on and listen to that, get it like that. And, oh, and right he just said, if you don't win it, he says, me and Mr. Jenkinson. And so you didn't, you didn't use any music that day then? Yes, we did for contest. Yeah. Did for contest. When we played it oh. for judges' benefit. Yeah. We had the music there, but we never turned it over. And this was time when chaps were looking at back. Yeah, then we're, when they were all crowded around. Yeah, and then they would leave you then, did you? Yeah. It was Saturday morning. You know. We met all trains from Sheffield, and uh, me, and two more that could become ringers, was Norman Tleesby. Norman Tleesby, yeah, Stringer. That way, didn't we you? We were taking them up to Wesleyan Chapel. The Sean Wake contest was. And then to committee Arsolby and Nuntle and them, they, they took them to a pub which they were allocated to. We were all a pub job, weren't we? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there no tells then, were there? Well, first contest they were in, Ettlesfield. Uh, first, first order at the pub they went to, it was 21 points. I don't want it with Will Jackson, we're 21 that day. Yeah. They ordered 21 points, anyway. And uh, it was only a little pull, was what they told me. And yeah. Landlady to go around collecting pot pots because they hadn't chance enough pot pots oh, yeah. to sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we're, they're only Saturday good balls up every time we went anyway, didn't they, Ken? Oh, yeah. They all enjoyed that themselves. Was, well, that after, after, nah, after, well, that after it ringing, that was before. Yes, after it ringing. After it ringing. Ah, but this yeah. was before it ringing, you know, when first contest. What? I went, they'd never been to a contest before. Oh, um, was that? Ecclesfield. Oh, yeah. Um, They've never been to a contest before 1911. No, no, it'd be 19... 19 oh, no. It'd be about 1908, I think, Ken. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know whether you knew Asbury Station or not. At Manchester. It, it, it would stop before, before Manchester. Manchester. We got off at Ashbury yeah, no, from Belleville. Yeah. Well, at bottom corner there were a pub. So this bloke, this chap over with us, says, hey up, I says, uh, let's go, this is on the way home. I said, let's go and see if my father's in here. I says, he, he likes a drink. So anyway, we went in this pub. And who should be sat at this first table were Albert Bratch and my father. And the empty glass. So I says, now then, Albert, I says, uh, are you drinking? He says, no, he says, landlady said we've had too much. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I says, could you manage one? Oh, the guy could always manage one. So I says, no, I says, do you want a pint? He says, ah, and Albert, right, do you want a pint? I'll, I'll have a pint. So I turn around, gets two pints from me, and turns around to get him, and Albert, right, sure, that's wrong, it fell off at stool. Yeah. So I did it. I haven't finished yet. We get uh, we got on platform eventually, and uh, someone shout, "Hey, up! There's a chap for that railway." So I went. I shoved my weight up front and my father. Mm. About a dozen jumped up platform as drunk as he was, and they were as all fast as they got him up. Some girls pulled him down. Mm. Well, poor to come jumps that line, turns his lamp to red and stop this train coming into the station. Of course, and then they were after my father and he was a railway man, what did he got? Secretary, they got him. 
Som en bloke går över till och du tar till dig en bully in him somewhere. Well, we got him bullied anyway. Everything went off all right. My mother didn't speak to him for a fortnight. <laughs> and we do coach you then. Find out if it's if it's a tune that people know, they take to it and they like it. But when we every time we ring Kelly for Baghdad, and he always always ask for it again. Well, it's it's a, a piece that's like it's like watching watching them ring. It's, that's part of entertainment, isn't it? We animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah.